Hello everyone, my name is Anish Nangare and I'm the founder of SageArt. SageArt is a platform that allows users to experience artworks, to connect to the stories behind them, and enables customizability on products based on your liking. We believe in giving small voices the opportunity to create unique products. We believe in giving them a space to uh, grow, their in, uh, grow their fan base, cater to the design needs of art enthusiasts, influencers, and companies. Here are some insights on the market. Uh, the digital art industry has been growing rapidly over the past few years, and we are seeing like two folds growth year on year in revenue and in online purchases. During the pandemic, I worked as a digital marketing manager, and through my work with graphic designers, I realized that they were actually digital artists that didn't have a uniform platform to monetize their artwork. They didn't have a space that connected them to the right audiences. This hindered them uh, greatly and the lack of business acumen prevented them from converting their artworks into monetizable products. And this prevented a lot of talented artists from going mainstream. Have you heard the phrase, that should be on a t-shirt? If you have, then you are our target audience. Sage is a platform that allows your creativity to come to life in the form of cool designs on t-shirts, hoodies, posters, stickers, and much more. This opens a world of possibility for self-expression, a means to represent your creative imagination. Along with that, influencers get to monetize their personal brands using high quality merchandise. As companies are expanding and moving towards growing their digital footprints, they require digital assets for branding, promotion, and events. We are providing a professional space for them to collaborate with artists, eliminating the problem associated with freelancers. After our customer discovery, we've talked to over 30 artists and online art buyers, and we found out their exact pain points. We were able to identify that there was a need for a recommendation model, just like how YouTube recommends videos, Spotify recommends music, Sage recommends art based on your liking. There, is a demand, there was also a demand for customization amongst buyers because they wanted to buy something really personal. And to make it unique, we realized that machine learning can help make these way cheaper customizations right on the platform. And we are powering all of our machine learning through the data that is coming through from the users on our platform. Let's get to the revenue. Uh, we charge a 40% markup on manufacturing, 20% is for Sage, and 20% is for the artists. So a t-shirt like this could be manufactured for $22, and we can sell for about 40 bucks. And the custom works are about 50% higher in prices as there's a commissioning fee associated with them. Influencers can get their designs made by commissioning artworks from artists, and on that we charge a 10% fee. The products that get manufactured have a 10% markup for Sage, and 30% of it goes to the influencer. We have uh, companies that can purchase digital assets for a subscription of $19.99 per month, and a set amount of artworks can be downloaded. We are also offering premium artist uh, plans for artists to get data analytics uh, on what are the trends, themes, and what artworks to create, when to post them, and how to get to the right audiences. The progress we've made through the Accelerator program. We've got vendors who are ready to manufacture high quality products for us. We have a MVP website that we're currently using to understand customer requirements in design. And we're also onboarding multiple artists through our social media promotions. We have uh, gotten a bunch of inquiries from Penn State clubs for their design requirements as they need t-shirts and hoodies each year. And we are also launching our e-commerce platform on April 28th this year, and we're excited to get you all on board. We're launching in India and the US, and you can now submit your designs by scanning this QR code, and we can get back to you with a code. And this is the team making Sage possible. And we hope to bring Sage to you as soon as possible. Thank you.
Okay, judges, we have two minutes for questions. Uh, <clears throat> quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, copyright issues. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you confirm that someone that's submitting something it isn't already copyright, copyrighted? So we have algorithms that can track an image and go through a database and identify if it's previously utilized somewhere. So an exact image can never be like re-uploaded by another artist. Can you just repeat for me what your what the problem is that you're solving? So we are solving design as a problem for influencers, for uh, individual users. Like if you had an idea for a T-shirt and you saw something similar on H&M's website, you can't tell H&M to really do something for you as a change on their design. And that's what we're solving. And for companies, like they need T-shirts, uh, branding materials, uh, corporate gifting. And all of these are basically design works that they get done through freelancers or design agencies. But only large scale companies are able to afford such big designs done for events and stuff. So we are catering to the small and mid scale uh, companies and influencers. Do you envision the artists being full time employees or are the artists people who pop into the site or app um, <clears throat> to, to get cash when needed? Uh, it's the second uh, that you said, like they would come up based on how they feel about it, but we have like uh, a tier system through which artists can really uh, expand into a full-time job kind of thing where if you do become a tier one artist, then you get higher margins, you get uh, to upload much more artworks like we have a limit on new artists. We've done this so that we can promote quality artists, but also not stop new artists from coming in. Thank you. So how many subscribers would you say you need to reach a break even point? Uh, since we have multiple revenue streams, we, we, we kind of see uh, product sales as our primary driving force as of now. And moving to the subscription model, we would need about 300 subscribers. And how long do you think that you can sustain that with below 300? How, uh, how fast do you think you can get to that? Uh, so right now the MVP that we are launching is actually without that model, we are directly doing the product sales model and the e-commerce side of the platform. And from then, from that point, we can put in more money and then get those ROIs through subscriptions. Thank you. All right, great job. Thank you, Anish. Thank you. And these are some of the t-shirts that we have, uh, some mock-ups that we created. If anybody's interested in buying these, please let me know. <laughs> good, good. All right, so next up we have Group It. Um, still the name? Okay. Next up, we have Group It. And again, uh, these teams this semester, go ahead and get your stuff set up. These teams this semester in the MVP program have made pivots. And that's what we've been working on with them. Like, oh, let's test the market and see if we need to make pivots. So um, we have Group It, and they're ready to pitch. Do you guys need a mic? What this makes us different from other Penn State services is our un that was supposed to be muted. <laughs> Hello, my name is Matt Christensen, and I'm the founder of Groupit. My name is Mason. My name is Tamar. And I'm Josh. And I'm Jess. I want to start off with a story. My personal experience at Penn State. So I started off at Penn State Berks. I did the two plus two program and I was thrilled to go to UP. Everyone told me about how exciting it was, how, how much engaging the community was, and I was happy to be there. Once I set my foot on Penn State main campus, I felt how overwhelming it was. I thought I was a social butterfly. I could talk to anybody. But the overwhelmingness of all this community, all these new faces, I just felt overwhelmed. I tried to get involved, the student orientation a program and the involvement fair. And the more I talk to people, the more, more organizations, you know, just more and more faces passed by. I felt alone and I felt I couldn't find people. So, but I'm not alone. 
And this is the problem. It's, there's a problem because there's 53% of college students experience a sense of loneliness. So our target market, first year students, st students that are freshmen, it's their first experience at main campus. It's a large campus. There's a lot of opportunity there. See, they're trying to reach out. They're going on the engagement app. 51% are on the engagement app. They're our first years, freshmen, looking for opportunities. So introducing a platform. We believe in rather than short-term events, but longer events, travel opportunities, something that you can commit to something more of a memorable experience, something you can engage, uh, maybe build a friendship upon. Introducing our platform, Group It. We want to bring people together and create a better world. And how are we bringing people together? Well, we're introducing a centralized platform where people can engage from all other organizations, host their trips through our platform, as well as start our own trips. So people can meet peers who are interested in fellow activities that they would be interested in as well. But it's just to bring people together to a platform so they can you know, get that memorable experience, feel welcomed to this new campus. So why? Why is this important? We want to make it affordable for students as well as make and have, give them a memorable experience. So, but why is the question is, the thing is they're feeling overwhelmed. They, they want to get out there, right? But the thing is, a lot of, there's a lot of margins, there's a lot of uh, walls, barriers blocking them from doing this. Communication, awareness, affordability, these are all issues we want to address. So why we want to do this? We want to bring people together. So let's talk about our revenue streams. How do we make money in such a thing that's so giving, so philanthropy driven? So starting off, we're going to do package sales. So that includes tickets, transportation, and food. So it's a package deal. You know, we're starting off small. We want to include affordability, but we want to reach that market where, you know, it's an all-inclusive meals, tickets, travel, transportation, you know, because there's a huge transportation issue. But, you know, we also want to do partnerships, you know, relationships with businesses, bringing travel and volume to that business in return of some kind of revenue. But our most important revenue is marketing, the scalability, you know, bringing a centralized platform where all students are engaging in opportunities while connecting other organizations that are already doing, you know, trips and um, events and such like that. We can engage them, scale them. So where did we start? We started in I the Ideas Maker. Um, competition, or sorry, uh, <laughs> our projections. So what are we doing after the idea, um, after the fast track accelerator? You know, we had a lot of pivots. We learned a lot, a lot of different things. So how are we starting? Trips, Hershey Park trips, April to May. We're starting off small, and those trips are going to be engaging through the channels of the engagement application through organizations. And we're going to provide a trip. We're going to do. We're going to test it. We're going to see how engaged students are with these. Um, such of uh, events, and we're going to go to Dorney, we're going to go to Philadelphia, and then we're going to make our way to um, international students. We're going to tackle the problem with transportation. You know, a lot of students are trying to get out and visit these tourist attractions in bigger cities, but there's a huge barrier of getting them to point um, B, where it will be airports and other locations, you know, to reach out to maybe California. Then we want to get to uh, abroad students, making it more affordable, giving them an opportunity to explore abroad, in a, in a more engaging environment so they know what they're getting into. And then we want to get summer trips, vacations. We want to test the market before our grand finale. You know, we want to make sure we can pro provide affordable but also an engaging opportunity to um, line up for when we're ready to, for this uh, sweet spot of three to four months before spring break. But thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Yes, my question is, how are students affording these trips? And are you making partnerships with the places that you're traveling to? I, I, that's my, my, I'm just trying to think when I was a student about doing all these things and, and going to these places, are, do you guys have partnerships? Of course. Um, so to start off, you know, a lot of big places, for example, Hershey, they offer deals if you have a certain amount of people, like for example, 20 people, the margin is 50, 60 percent cheaper than the regular price if you're, you know, traveling individually. Also, the bus, if we're doing transportation through bus, free passes, we don't pay for parking there. 
but you know we're making it more affordable by doing it in bulk. We're buying in bulk. That's how we're making it more affordable. Right now, I, we connected with businesses like Hershey, but we want to connect with organizations because organizations provide you know, cheaper travel through their funding, through UPAC and such like that. You know, we're going to help them organize their trips. We're going to increase their engagement. So those funds will bring in to make it more affordable. Thank you. So my question is about making revenue. Mm -hmm. So I understand that the students will be paying and covering the cost of their trip, but if it's meant to be more affordable for the student, do they not have to pay more money so that you can have a margin? So in the beginning, we have, we have a bigger mission. We wanna bring people together, right? We wanna make it affordable. But that's the, that's the biggest question, right? Making money. So obviously, yes, we're you know, charging uh, $30, $40 per ticket, right? To make some kind of revenue. But our end goal is to get enough users onto our platform, engaging in a centralized platform where we can utilize the biggest industry out there, marketing. The marketing is scaling. The, the industry is huge. So by providing a centralized platform, businesses would like to you know, promote their trips or maybe their um, businesses onto our platform. And that's our scalability and sustainability in the business. So B2B mainly, yeah? Yes. Okay. All right, next up we have Stella with Beyond Class. Sorry, her phone. She's mic'd up and ready to go. Oh, yeah, incredible. Okay, should I start? Be the greater fool. A greater fool is someone who is a perfect blend of self-delusion and ego thinking that you can succeed but what others have failed. Hello, my name is Stella and I'm the founder of Beyond Class. During the pandemic, I was laid off from my internship. Luckily, I found this website hosting all the resources for students to succeed, including the internships, case competitions, and research opportunities in Korea. Luckily, using my, using my background of international politics, I was able um, I competed in the competition hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and using my background of international politics major, I was able to place the third place and with an award and $500 and a great experience to add on my resume. So I wanted this success story for all students, regardless of their social and economic backgrounds. I realized that a lot of my US friends were facing the similar problems, that where resources were abundant, but the information was scattered. So Beyond Class brought this concept to the US education market as a solution. We solved the information divide among college students and educational inequality, starting from Penn State. Penn State is a great university with 12 academic colleges and 76,000 students. So they provide a lot of information, including um, and resources helping students to succeed, but how efficient and effective are they getting to us? There's no channel hosting all the school events helping students to find the right teammates for the, uh, for the competitions to compete or alerting students with the deadlines of the application or scholarships. Through our customer discovery, among 126 students, 83% have answered they, find they face the sa uh, same problem. Not, not finding the right, um, not knowing where to find their information of the events, um, not, not being eligible for the events or finding the right teammates and missing the deadlines of the application. So Beyond Class, being your personal companion to your educational journey, we built an edutech platform that aggregates and recommends your resources aligned with your interests and your profiles. Our AI engine filters and recommends the resources with the deadlines, and we currently are working with our professors to create the exclusive events so that students can, students can further um, test their potentials beyond class. Um, it allows students to equal chances to compete regardless of their majors or backgrounds. For example, here's our Penn State persona, Blue White, and she is a fifth semester standing with 3.4 point GPA, Eberly College of Science and Data Science major. She's looking for a scholarship, but as you see, the website does not hold all the information as she would like, as you can see on the picture. So. Um, oh my God. 
understanding the needs and the wants of our users, we now are on a mission to empower each student's success. Unlike other social or engagement apps, we leverage AI to match the students' profiles to the events that they would have the most impact on. Now, as you see, Blue White already have the tailored events that match with her profiles, and she now doesn't have to go through. It will save her time and be matched with the events that she would have most impact on putting her in her resume and on her educational journey. So we already have we already have 100, 100 beta users on our MVP before our general release in August. Our rev two revenue streams include the hosting fee and advertising from the enterprise and freemium models from our users. Our premium users would get an additional features including the sharing profiles to their teammates and more upcoming features as we discuss going forward. Witnessing its successful market, um, Witnessing its, witnessing its successful business model, being, uh, business, su business model being successful in Korea, understanding the US market, we have no doubt that, our, that this product will be successful in the United States. Since 2022, we have been part of the two accelerated programs, including the Idea Test Lab and Fast Track Accelerating Pro Accelerator Program. In March, we recently launched our MVP, and uh, this week, Saturday, we have competed as the top six finalists on the INQ, and we placed a third with 2.5K uh, for our grants to use it for our customer discovery and hiring our backend developer. Oh. It was a great opportunity to be a part of the Fast Track Accelerator program with our fellow participants and our advisors. On behalf of our team, um, we, we sincerely appreciate this opportunity to grow as a team and see the potentials of Beyond Class. Thank you for your time and consideration. Judges, you have two minutes for questions. Congratulations on, on your win so far, by the way. Thank you. So, uh, oh, so are there going to be categories um, that uh, students who use the app can filter by? So when we did the customer discovery, we laid out a lot, around 11 categories that they could find internships, research, um, club activities, social events. And among those 11, they, the, most vote, the most top three voted categories were um, competitions, scholarships, and networking events. So those are the ones listed on our current MVP and we're going to expand from there. Oh, and is it a person or people who are going to be aggregating the eligibility and all of the data that's in there or is it machine learning? So currently um, we're working this, we're, we're working on our own, but we hope to with the grants and going forward, we want to make it to machine learning and AI development, yeah. Sorry, I'm not a very, my teammates who are in the tech team aren't here, so I unfortunately cannot answer that part of it, but we're all, we will move forward in that progress. Yeah, thanks. Um, are there competitors already in this space that you found? So we did the alpha and beta tests with our customer as if you want, let me go back to the slide, but I guess not. But if you see the revenue stream slide, there it says the 6.99 per month per user. And with the, uh, we did the alpha and beta test with our competitors being the LinkedIn, um, one of them, and there were lists of the competitors that we did, but one is handshakes, um, even the school boards on the libraries or at the hub, those are also our competitors because they are on, but the thing is they are unorganized. It's not, you have to go through all the papers to see which opportunities that you could find. So those are our competitors, even though it's not making um, the revenue or the cost is different, but the, pro, um, the user experience would be much successful on our end. All right, thank you to be on class. Thank you. All right, next up, we're queuing up uh, Elise Johnson with Finding Community. Can you hear me now? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Elise Johnson, and I am a co-founder of Finding Community. 
Finding community mission is to build an accessible, inclusive future for neurodiversity. We work in partnership with a local nonprofit named called the Acres Project. If you're not familiar, the term neurodivergent refers to anyone who diverges in terms of ways of thinking that is different from the norm. That can include people with autism, OCD, ADHD, et cetera. I'm personally a part of this community, and which is why I thrive in the Happy Valley Lodge box. People with ADHD are three times more likely to start their own business, but this comes equally with struggles. Out of 180,000 individuals and counting in Pennsylvania with autism, 85% are unemployed and have a college degree. They are also three times more likely to commit suicide. Society was not built for them and they lack access and support and opportunity as a result. Neurodivergents want to thrive, but they lack the people who are willing to accommodate them. Therefore, finding community improves the, the overall well-being of neurodivergence by tackling three main issues. Creating a sense of belonging and community, creating an ability, creating an opportunity for profitable purpose by bolstering employment in a centralized location and a safe space to learn self-sufficiency. This will then move on to be an opportunity to have housing, so all of these three elements are incorporated in one location. Prior to this uh, program, I started a Discord server, which has 113 members across Penn State campuses to be able to find their, the community that they belong with. We meet once a week in the SDR resource office at University Park to share experiences and grow together. This leads me to the question of how do you sustain a social good cause, a social enterprise? We moved on with our partnership with the Acres Project to develop a farmer's market. Patroning our market supports the chronically underserved neurodivergent community. There is a demand for supporting these individuals. For example, when I've sold products at, with Eggers in other craft fairs, an individual will walk past me and look at all our towels and try and buy one. And when I say this was made by an individual with autism, they will double their purchase. Or someone who's walking past will turn around when I say it's not just the soap, this is supporting an individual. Our farmer's market will take place May through November in the Happy Valley Sports Center complex. We were able to negotiate this parking lot for free and all vendor fees, we have spots for 26 vendors, will go to support this community. In addition, additionally, there will be two booths that provide crafts solely made by individuals with autism. Our target audience and our target customer is not just individuals who attend other local farmer's market. This is parents coming to pick up their children from, sports, from the sports center who value healthy living and philanthropy, but live busy lives and don't always get around to coming back or to giving back. So therefore, they're able to come and attend our farmer's market in a very convenient location and give back without having to go out of their way. It's very convenient for them. Right down here to the bottom right, that is where the Acres Project is located. So all of this is in one centralized location. In the future, we'll be able to have a housing complex there where individuals can both live, work, and grow in one centralized location. So we've created the community, we're testing the profitability, and next, once this is sustainable, we will be able to move on to the Nest Project and create a housing community for these individuals. This model can be scaled to not just the rest of the neurodivergent community outside of Center County, but also to other underserved populations in the community, such as veterans. It can be replicated and finding community is more than willing to help these ventures success, succeed. So what I ask of everybody here is to please find me in my basket and get a brochure to learn a little bit more, get some buttons, and come and visit us once we're able to start up in May. We have an interest form on our brochure, so please spread the word and come and support our community. Great job. Uh, judges, two minutes for questions. Well, first of all, as a former board member of Acres, I greatly commend what you're doing. Um, just quick question. So if you do raise funds with the market, are the, is it going to go back into supporting the Acres projects? Is that the plan? 
Yeah, so this will benefit, will be sold through Acres Artisans, which is an LLC. They'll have booths. The vendor fees go back into the Acres project, and then they commission our community and support with our workforce expenses. I mean, how many employees do you need to start up, and you know, are they volunteers at this point, or is it are they paid? As of now, since I started the finding community and it resonated with the Acres mission, they commissioned me for the work that and the time that I put into it. Right now, we have three employees that are supported through the Acres project, bringing this forward. And right now, we are ready to go with those employees that we have. And we also have artisans that are producing the products. So it's us organizing it so that neurodivergent individuals can produce the products that they want. We sell them in a supportive environment. Thank you. Just a quick question. How do you find the artisans? How do you find the people that are making the products that are selling? Yeah, so we find them not just by marketing, finding community within Penn State. That's how we found a lot. But also within the community, people who attend the Acres Project, they serve over 250 individuals. They are referred to be a part of our programs and given that opportunity. Thank you to Elise Johnson and Finding Community. Awesome job. So we have two more pitches in the build program. Next up, we have Becky with PCOS Network. Hello all, so my name is Becky Bomberger and I am here presenting my uh, company PCOS Care Network. So PCOS Care Network aims to provide care, support, education, research, and empowerment to women that are diagnosed and struggling with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. So many of you probably aren't aware or know of PCOS. Um, unfortunately, one in 10 women in the US are diagnosed with PCOS. There is no cure, and unfortunately, there's no perfect treatment. Um, treatments currently only manage the symptoms of PCOS and do not treat the condition itself. Uh, there's a pretty big lack of knowledge about PCOS. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's considered a syndrome because we don't know the underlying disease. And there's very limited research and funding in PCOS. Unfortunately, uh, PCOS gets less than 0.1% of federal funding. So this is not a pretty slide, and it's not meant to be. Uh, this is what women with PCOS deal with every single day. Um, each woman has different symptoms in varying degrees. Um, and some have more rather than others. Unfortunately, I am diagnosed with PCOS, so I uh, have to deal with some of these things. So what are we doing and why? Um, unfortunately, women are very frustrated with their care. It takes about an average of seven doctors until they can find somebody that is knowledgeable about PCOS and that will be able to uh, treat them. Battling stigma, uh, this is kind of a, a big thing that is starting to change. Um, a lot of doctors have this idea that women were bringing on their PCOS, and that's, not, uh, that's absolutely not true. Um, unfortunately, uh, PCOS can be something that is genetic, possibly, um, as well as being environmental. These women are completely hopeless. There's no cure. Uh, so they struggle with their symptoms every day. A lot of times the treatments that are out there are actually worse than living with the daily symptoms. And they feel alone, which is crazy because one in 10 women are diagnosed at least with PCOS. So currently what our agenda is, um, initially coming into the BUILD program, I had these high hopes of having this telehealth platform and I had no idea how to get there. <laughs> so luckily we learned how to come up with our MVPs. So what we're working on right now is um, doing webinars, uh, virtual support groups, continuing education, and um, we are trying to build our brand. So currently we are working to partner with some doctors that are doing research and they're going to be putting on some webinars um, as well as we'll be doing some virtual support groups, possibly local support groups, 
And um, we're hoping to also eventually do some continuing education for doctors to um, broaden and uh, educate. Um, the way we are funding this, which is probably a big question of, of how that's going to happen, um, is that we are getting sponsored by different pharmaceutical companies that may have drugs for PCOS treatment um, or some of the, to treat some of the symptoms. And we're also partnering with some uh, infertility companies that have either management um, devices, it could be technology, um, and other products that could possibly help PCOS. So our future plan is to eventually provide healthcare to women via telehealth. Um, so the idea would be that they'd be able to get onto a platform and meet with different specialized doctors. Uh, unfortunately, PCOS is linked to diabetes, heart disease, several different kinds of cancers. Um, and so we are hoping to have a bunch of different specialized doctors that are also very knowledgeable about PCOS and can work in a team setting to provide the best care and come up with the best uh, treatment plans for these women. And we're also hoping to um, be able to have a database of all these women with PCOS. And we're hoping that we're, we'll be able to take that and start making some correlations and possibly even help uh, these researchers that we are partnering with. Uh, to provide them that database. So I'd like to put all my references up here because I swear I didn't make this stuff up. <laughs> and at this time, I'd like to thank you all for listening in on my little project here, and I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, Becky's a good reminder that the Happy Valley Lunchbox also serves community and students, faculty, and staff. So you'll get to see a good mix of um, different types of entrepreneurs in the room. So Becky, awesome job. Judges, two questions or two minutes for questions. Okay, sorry. Um, can you clarify? Are you already? You said you were going to monetize because farm pharmaceutical companies were going to partner with you. Are you partnered with some of them already or is that the plan? That is currently, we do have some that are interested. We don't have anything solid yet. That is actually what we're working on currently. Okay. As well as lining up different doctors to do the webinars. I guess my question when it comes to farm um, funding the business and um, fertility institutions, is, do you see any conflict of interest there um, with offering a holistic approach um, on, on the app, um, if that's, let's say, like what's evidence-based mm -hmm. or up-to-date? Yeah, so um, it's interesting because with PCOS, a lot of what is suggested is always be healthy, right? Um, so be as healthy as you can. That's never going to just cure your PCOS. But... Um, so a holistic approach is really important for PCOS. And um, most people are very uh, open-minded on that. So the idea was to match each webinar with something that would be appropriate for that. Uh, so different people doing different uh, research in clinical research with drugs and things like that will match with that company that's providing that drug. All right. Well, thank you, Becky, for your time. We have one more question. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> have you thought of any other revenue possibilities, a user fee or anything like that? Yeah. That so could... right now I'm looking into, um, and I talked a little bit about building a brand. So the idea is if we can get people to start um, coming while well, being open about their PCOS and um, one in 10 women have it. So it is something that is very relative. Uh, so we're hoping sort of like uh, Livestrong and Susan G that we would be able to really build that brand and um, and then move along to the telehealth health platform of this. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Great job, Becky. 
All right, our final team in the MVP program in our build program is Danger Fit. So they're going to come on out and we're going to hand them the mic. So welcome to Danger Fit. Oh, there you go. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Monk. I'm the CEO of Danger Fit LLC. I served three and a half years in the Marine Corps as a combat engineer. I'm currently a senior studying business management. To my right is James Jardine, my CEO. He is a junior studying criminology, and he's currently serving four years in the Army National Guard as an infantryman, which he currently just came from today, and he's going back there tonight. So at Danger Fit, our mission is to take traditional fitness and gym equipment, such as the barbell, enhance them, and create solutions that will maximize your body's full potential. So the problem that James and I personally experienced in the gym is that we're not achieving our muscles' full potential when completing compound movements. Compound movements are lifts that incorporate more than one muscle, such as bench, rows, squats, deadlifts, push-ups. Now, to solve this problem, we are engineering the monkey grips, which are an innovative patent-pending accessory that can attach and detach on any barbell that you own. I'm a sponsor for the Learning Factory right now, and the Learning Factory is a program at Penn State that has, I have six engineers currently designing this right now, four mechanical, one industrial, and one biomedical engineer. They work on this weekly, and they send me weekly updates. The engineer's goals are to make the monkey grip safe, durable, and move simultaneously. Now, these grips slide on the barbell, extending and retracting your hand grip in order to help your body achieve maximum growth. These grips are efficient in the gym since you won't have to waste time completing other grips. And they're more beneficial than the barbell because they allow the freedom of movement when you're coming down. So that way, it's better for people with shoulder injuries and wrist injuries because it takes the weight off your joints and spreads it towards more mass of different muscles. We're also designing a mesh bag to carry the monkey grips in to keep it nice compact in your home or at gym. So for people who have carry gym bags at home, you put it right in the corner there, it stays nice and compact. Uh, the monkey grips are estimated to have a retail cost of $80 to $100. We expect this to be a lot lower. This is just due to the Penn State equipment costs and materials right at this moment. So production costs are about $35 per unit to build. We expect that to also be lower once we find the right supplier. So in 2022, the market for the home gym equipment was $15.13 billion. And in 2023, it rose to $16.55 billion. Now, this is a massive market, and that is just for the people in the home gym. We're looking more towards people in the home gym community, since this will be an easy product. And I feel if I sold this to more gyms, it'd be easily stolen, since it's a small piece of equipment, and it already happens in today's gym. That's just the way the world works. So uh, here you can see we've got the retail cost of 80 and the production cost of 35 and also for the fitness equipment market in 2023 is 87 billion, which is even a larger market for any type of fitness equipment, whether that goes from resistance bands to bench presses to anything. Now, when uh, me and James went to the Arnold Classic on March 4th, the Arnold Classic is Arnold Schwarzenegger's world-renowned bodybuilding expo for a weekend with bodybuilding strongman fitness. There's even medieval fighting, jujitsu, Muay Thai, awesome competition, it was so much fun. So we did a survey there and we got 49 responses and these are the people who would buy the monkey grips after we asked them questions, demonstrated the product and showed them the videos that you previously just saw. We had 37 of them say yes, which is about 72.9%. Now, one of the, our competitive advantage for this product is that we are incorporating stabilizer muscles along with the primary movers. Stabilizer muscles such as the serratus anterior are the smaller muscles that people don't really talk about when lifting. Those are the muscles that aren't really used as much, but they're as important. Now, when using this monkey grip, you can extend out when benching and come in and that uses your stabilizer muscles, which all in turn makes your body stronger than just using a regular bench press. So for the monkey grips, uh, we're targeting people who are between the age of 18 and 45, lift three or more times a week, carry a gym bag or have a home gym, and our initial target, but anybody can use the monkey grips. In order to generate income, we'll sell these monkey grips around eighty dollars, and we're selling on our website via e-commerce and retail. We also have lines of apparel going through that will be reinvested right back into our company. Our future plans consist of adding in the scooper saver, which James will talk on for a brief second. So the scoop saver is, met, is meant for anybody that uses supplements, powdered, no matter what age, for whether it's a bone enhancement, pre-workout, whatever it may be. This is going to keep your scoop on top every single time you open the product. We have two ways of going about this, one through licensing and one direct to consumer. Price point is we're looking about $3 retail and manufacturing cost, we can get down to 59 cents. 
Yep. Awesome. And this is another response we got to Arnold Classic. Would you buy the scuba to save a product? And 64% of people said yes. We're also looking at adding on the Wonder Bar, which is a multi-grip accessory that can use for cable attachments, and the hand grenade, which is used for tricep extensions, which is one of my favorite extensions. All right. And also to recap, targeting just about anybody for this market, anybody would lift. And for on March 25th, which is this Saturday, Omega Delta Sigma, which is the veteran fraternity we belong, and actually Hayes belongs in right over there. We are hosting the annual Murph, which is the Michael Murphy Challenge, which is for the Medal of Honor recipient, Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who is a Penn State alumni, and he died in Afghanistan. If you don't know who he is, he's the movie Lone Survivor. That's what it's about. So if you're ever interested in that, let us know. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, can you adjust the tension in this to make it comfortable for the user, or is it all one tension? So the engineers are currently making it simultaneously, and one of the ideas we have is to have um, some type of uh, elastic band in the middle, so that way when you're coming down, you have to apply some tension to pull it out, but when you're coming in, it makes it easier, that way it also prevent injury, so people don't like struggle coming out and then tear pack. And also in the videos you saw, there are the grips, orange pieces in the middle, there's a safety so that way you don't come in too close, lose balance, and hurt yourself or go out too far and tear muscle, which obviously no one wants. And have you looked into product liability costs? I'm sorry? Have you looked into product liability costs? We're currently in the process of that right now. We have another meeting scheduled next week to talk to the law clinic, and I've recently talked to them about looking into um, talking to insurance companies about that. So that's all my next steps. So... Once you explained it, I thought it made total sense. I never, and I'm like a gym person, athlete, I never ever would have thought like I'm not using these muscles and I could be. So how do you get people to know that they need your product? How do we get people to know? How do you, yeah, how are you going to spread the word? What's your plan to get people to know about it? Yeah, so we're going to be expanding a lot on social media right now. And we're, I'm actually applying for the digital test lab, which I'll learn a lot about marketing. And James is going to take point on the marketing here, but obviously I'll be assisting that. And we're also going to use, signed up for, I signed up for Google Analytics, so that way I'll be able to see how people are looking at my website, what they're clicking on, that way I can improve what needs to be improved. My question is kind of adjacent to that. Can you speak a little bit more about the problem and how that problem impacts the, how the target audience actually feels that problem or recognizes that they have a problem? You got some? So one of the major um, injuries when it comes to lifting is rotator cuff, rotator t like shoulder tears and everything like that. When you have that type of injury, basically the, you're confined to doing dumbbell presses. This is going to be a way to um, have like a dumbbell press and a bench press in the same way and just build stability in the muscles to str not necessarily because you can't like repair a rotator cuff, but this is going to give the muscles around it enough to rebuild and strengthen it itself, so. Thank you for your service, guys. Um, it's an honor to serve. Yeah, and is this a unique product, and do you have any competitors? Yes, yeah, so this is a unique product. Like I said, it is patent pending, but there is a competitor called the Squeeze Bar. It's a Germany-based company, and the difference is it is one entire barbell, so as mine are just the grips, and safety is attaching on and off a barbell on any barbell you own. There is this one entire barbell, and the grips are inlined into it as one whole system, and it costs 2,000 US dollars, where mine is going to be $80, and it can fit in your home gym or go anywhere with you. When it comes to the scoop saver, there's nothing like it, because every we, we went and we talked to Bucked Up, which is a major supplement company, and they couldn't figure out a way to go under, because everything needs to have a seal on top for FDA. And they're like, oh, we can't do it, and they just gave up on it. But we figured out a way that we can do it inside under the seal, so it's still safe and FDA approved, that they just didn't think of. So. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna bring it out to James and he's gonna turn it over. Guys, feel free to get up, grab um, sustenance, cupcakes and food. Um, but James is gonna talk us a little through some, some um, stuff. Uh, judges, can I see you in the hall? Let's give all the teams another round of applause for coming up here. It's not easy. It's not easy to come up here and talk about uh, Prague. Super vulnerable up here uh, going through stuff. I remember going through the, pro the, the process myself and having to pitch 
Uh, and it is way scarier than anybody up here just made it seem. So um, that was awesome. Uh, before I uh, do anything and chat with people, I want to give you all a chance to kind of talk to the people that you came with, because I'm sure you have uh, a lot of stuff you want to say about a lot of the presentations you just saw, and you haven't had a chance to do that. So let's take a couple of minutes. Uh, feel free to chat amongst yourselves, talk about those products, get some extra food, uh, and then we'll come back uh, when the judges are ready. So we'll let you have a little bit of chatting, and we'll see you soon. All right, it seems like everybody has gotten their, uh, their food. Are there any gluten-free uh, cupcakes left back there? Any? So my wife has celiac disease. There's a couple left. Okay, I'm going to steal one. There's five left? Oh, perfect. Four. There's only four. There are clearly only four there. I'm sorry, you counted that to five. Yeah, so cool. Now there's three gluten for, oh, you're taking it for me? <clears throat> I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell my wife, she's gonna be so excited. All right, so as we're waiting for um, the judges to get back, uh, I wanted to open up this uh, part of the, uh, of the evening to uh, ask you all, uh, if you have any questions at all about how a double major in math and economics who went for a PhD in economics uh, ended up opening up a 60-seat comedy club in State College, Pennsylvania, uh, as I know when I talk with people, uh, a lot of that I'm asked. So I wanted to see if anybody had any questions regarding that uh, except for my two students who showed up for this. You guys have already heard all of my... Yes, Peter, what's your question? Who inspires me? Oh, do, I want, do you want a real answer or a corny answer? Uh, because I would say my students inspire me to do that, but I wouldn't say that. Um, to, uh, to, be, to be honest, um, I get inspiration from a ton of people that I work with. So uh, running the comedy club, doing all my other stuff is never... Uh, going to make me these like buco bucks uh, and in fact sticking with the university as a full-time uh, professor would have definitely made the money come in more than what would be running a club but sitting with co-founders and with other people who are experiencing joy from something that I have created or helped create uh, makes me continue to do it over and over again uh, we just got back from Maryland doing a workshop uh, and they paid us to drive three hours to Baltimore City uh, College to do a one hour, one and a half hour improv workshop and then drove three hours back. And we charged them for every hour that we're going. And the reason was because their head of student activities used to work at Penn State and worked with us and then went to a new university and was like, we have to um, hire them. So seeing all that stuff really uh, makes the inspiration. Uh, also, I just crave attention, if you can't tell. Um, so when Elizabeth emailed me and was like, hey, we're thinking of doing a little more comedy and having like an MC come in and chat with people in between when the judges are doing it, I did not read the rest of the email. I just said, sure, I'll do it. Um, she said there would be cupcakes and Roots food, and I said, absolutely, I will be there. So, yeah. Any other questions up here about anything? Did I get my PhD? No. Uh, this, <laughs> this, what? I did not. Uh, I mean, I, I went to Southern California, so I was at UC Irvine, which is uh, the ant eaters. And if anyone knows anything about UC Irvine, this is the uh, fight symbol. It's an ant eater, and you go zot zot zot. And if that doesn't tell you how good our sports teams were at UC Irvine. I don't know what else will. It is, it's like this. It's, I guess it looks like an anteater. And there was some cartoon anteater that says zot, zot, zot back in like the 60s or 70s. Uh, and that's what uh, it is. We also used to say that UCI for UC Irvine uh, stood for under construction indefinitely, uh, which is also what I call Atherton Street here in State College. Um, so, so I thought that would get a bigger laugh, but that's... I don't have a, not enough people on tra that are interested in transportation, Ted, I guess, for, for that one to go. Uh, no, so I did not finish my PhD. Um, I left, honestly, I left because 
I wanted to do more teaching and it was a research one university and I had to do a ton of research. I had started my first business at that point. It was called ME tutoring. So it was one-on-one -on -one tutoring and group tutoring because I really love the teaching aspect of it. Uh, so I quit, but my therapist tells me I have to think more positive. So I left um, with a terminal masters. Um, and that's more true than I probably want to admit, <laughs> uh, which is also why I left doing the Pets I've Met app. I did not quit doing, doing it, you know, you don't quit. Although it does say somewhere here, I just put a sticker that says, don't quit your uh, day job or dream, do day dream. Don't quit your day dream, which is good. Any other questions about stuff when it comes to improv or comedy or anything? Okay, oh, right here, what's your name? Hi, Nathan. What are you here for? I have been in this room for five years. Oh, nice. Well, welcome into this room. All right, what's your question, Nathan? Can you teach us improv comedy? Oh, yes, for sure. I can definitely teach improv comedy, and we do classes. And I was, ho I was going to in the second, because I have two seven to ten minute blocks that I get to fill to talk to you, uh, tell some small jokes, although I said like five of them at the beginning when Elizabeth just said, hey, here's a microphone. And I was like, uh oh, I guess this is my first 10. Uh, and so in the second half, I'm actually going to hopefully run through with some people some very simple improv workshop exercises that you can do at your table uh, where we'll talk about exactly what improv is. Speaking of, does anybody know, has anyone, uh, by round of applause, let's see if there's anyone who wants to clap. Have you done improv theater before? Do I have any improvisers in here? Okay. <gasps> Yes, we've got a few people that have done improv. Uh, for those of you who have, have not done improv, what is improv comedy or improv theater? Who would like to give me a chance? Yeah. Just making stuff up as you go? Exactly. When it comes to improv theater, it's making stuff up, but there's a little bit, there's some guidelines that go along with it. I tell individuals to, when you're, you do improv every single day. I know you all improvise every single day because you didn't wake up this morning and write down minute by minute exactly what you were going to do. Improv theater in general, improvisation is just responding to the unexpected in a productive way. And you do that every single day because you walk up to Atherton and you did not write down, you know, or walk to College Ave, you didn't write down at 1243, I'm going to cross the street because you might get to the, you might get to College Ave and there's a bus coming at that time. And you think to yourself, well, that's not what I'm going to do. Because somebody taught you when you were three years old and just started walking towards streets like, hey, don't do that. So you made a decision to the unexpected where you responded productively. That's all we do on stage to put on a quote unquote show for you is I'll be on stage with one to five other people and whatever they do, my mind just says, how do I build upon that and respond productively to what they gave me? That's all improv is. Uh, and then there's some other things that you, uh, we've learned of the science of comedy Things work well in threes, so you want to tell jokes in threes. If you tell it two times, most people don't really see the pattern. If you say four times, they're bored with you. So if you watch any sort of comedy special, most times when they're doing a joke, they're doing it in threes. We also understand the ebbs and flows of energy when it comes to a show for a performance. But really at the core, it's just responding productively to something that is thrown at you. Um, and that can be applied to a ton of different uh, things, which is why we met with 62 educational leaders at Baltimore City College this morning. Um, and we've done workshops right in this room and we've done workshops downstairs. Uh, they're done, they're ready. All right, cool, we're gonna bring the judges back up here. We're gonna announce some winners and then uh, we're gonna see the second round uh, and this will be good. So thank you all so much. Actually, we're not announcing the winners. <laughs> we're gonna hold that you guys in suspense. We're gonna do the second round, but we have um, the judges coming back, filtering in. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way that I keep everybody in the room. <laughs> All right, well, in a few minutes, we're going to get started. Um, we're missing one more judge. Hope you guys are enjoying the food. So we have food tonight by Roots Kitchen, our Webster's Gourmet Girl, and um, the cupcakes are by... Um, Dolce Vita, yes. Yeah, so all local companies. Um, Roots is kind of local, but um, we're really happy to have them as vendors tonight. So thank you guys. And we're going to turn it over to Kevin in just a moment. Um, but thank you to James for. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hey, everyone. 
There we go. Holy smokes. Wow. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, so I'm very excited to be kicking off the accelerator program. Uh, and so my name is Kevin Harris. I'll get into that a little bit later. But so right now, as you can see, uh, this is a beautiful creek picture. And that's me. No, it's not. I don't have that kind of hair. Um, it, that was improv. And so <laughs> when I got out of the Army, uh, I spent a lot of time in northern Pennsylvania kayaking the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. And so I, I loved doing this. We did this almost every weekend. But I, every weekend, I had the same problem. And so there were two things that I was frustrated with. And so on the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, they have class one to two rapids, small to medium, as they say. Um, so not, nothing crazy, nothing crazy, not white water, right? And so I'd go through these rapids, and water would come up over the boat and land in my lap. And it was just, it was so, so enjoyable. Um, and, and you do this enough times, and your boat gets filled with water. It becomes unsafe. You got to pull over. You got to dump it out. Uh, and so that was the first problem I had. The second problem I had is when I would go through these rapids, right, I would have, I would have things with me, fishing gear, water bottles, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you had the only storage is back here. And so to get back here when your body isn't cooperating the most, it's pretty difficult. And so rapids are coming up. You're like, what do I do with my this stuff? Um, and, and what happens is it just rolls around. It just goes around. It goes way down there. Now I can't get it. And so those were the problems I was having. And so that's when I came up with what I'm calling the Wave Breaker and Wave Breaker Technologies. So Wave Breaker Technologies is an Army owned, a veteran owned and operated kayak accessory company. Our mission is to provide durable, dependable kayak accessories that increase the confidence and comfort of the user. And so, you know, I'm gonna show you what's going on here. Can I, can I not use the mic for this demonstration? Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, so, wave breaker, here it is. It mounts on, front, on the deck of your boat in front of the user. Goes on in about less than 10 seconds, once the permanent mounts are on, and there you have it. Uh, right now, this is a 3D printed model that I got made downstairs in the Origin Lab. They were nice enough to do that work for me. Uh, and this would represent a little gasket that would be underneath this unit uh, when it's totally complete. And so that's the wave breaker. There it is. Uh, you can store all kinds of goodies in here, your snacks, your drinks, your phone, your camera, six 12 ounce bottles or cans. And <laughs> so that is, that's the wave breaker. That's what we got going on. And so you're like, well, who's gonna buy this thing? Well, I'll tell you. Our customers, uh, they have three characteristics. They use rigid sit-in kayaks. They're flat water kayakers. And this is an experienced problem. So let me walk through this. So this is a rigid sit on top or sit inside kayak. Sit on top kayak, you can imagine the top half is missing. We're also not targeting kayaks that are inflatable or foldable, things of that nature. So it's, it's going to be this kind of kayak. This will not mount on a sit on kayak. So flat water, flat water could be considered anything that isn't white water and it's not the ocean. And so we're on lakes, we're on creeks, we're on rivers that aren't insane kind of thing. Um, because this unit right here, while it will do class two rapids, I'm, I'm not going to claim it's going to do three and four. We're not designing this for whitewater boats. They're a different shape. We're not designing this for ocean boats. They're a different shape, at least to begin. And the last thing is this is experience problem. So you may have bought your first kayak and now you realize, man, I'm getting wet. Or man, where do I put all my goodies? So that is our customer. So where are we now? Where we started was this little guy right here. This is made out of styrofoam that I made in my garage. And it works, works wonderfully. Um, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, so that's why we're moving on to this. We're moving on to looking at different manufacturing methods, different manufacturing materials. So what we've done in the past 10 weeks is customer discovery. Um, this unit is actually the third unit. And so one of the things that have changed over the course of the 10 weeks is that the storage compartment got bigger, right? We were talking to people and they were like, yeah, we don't like getting wet, but we really don't like losing our thing. That's why I left, holy smokes. So where are we going? We are manufacturing a small batch of units. We are attending outdoor shows at the end of May, the beginning of June. We're establishing our sales channels, which will be at this point in time, kayak pro shops, boutique style stores. That's where our customers are shopping and we're looking to establish a production model at scale. State of the market, uh, there's lots of money in the market. I don't have time to go into this right now, but the, the price of the unit is gonna be $150 to the user. Our estimated cost to produce 500 of these is 30 a unit. 
And the costs right now are at 120, and most of that is labor due to the origin labs in the basement. This is the important slide. What am I going to do if I'm fortunate enough to receive funding this evening? Uh, I'm going to produce some units. So I just told you we need to make these units. We need to get them on boats, get them in the water, have people break them so we know how to pivot from there. We're going to look at different attaching options. Right here, you can see we got the straps. Uh, that moved on from originally a single bolt that was through the boat. We're going to look into that. And we're going to have some professionals take pictures of this unit. As wonderful as my cats are, um, they, they aren't very professional. <laughs> So, thank you very much for staying with me tonight. I appreciate it. And I'd like to open it up for questions and hopefully answer any concerns you have. Why did you decide to go through pro shops mm -hmm. um, and retailers rather than direct to consumer? Okay, so this was discovered through talking with um, professionals in this sector, right? And so as we were talking, this is an experience problem, right? And so a lot of people, they go, they go to Dick's or they go to Dunham's, they buy their first cheap kayak, they use this kayak and they're like, I really like kayaking, but this kayak sucks. And I, I, need, I need storage, I need a fishing rod holder, I, I want to customize my boat. And so what happens is, is then they realize, okay, that's not where I buy my boat. I go to a professional, he will walk them through each boat, pros and cons, and then he can push them towards my product and say, hey, you need storage. And the people who are outfitting their boats, this is where they're shopping. Because another thing that, that works here is that the professional can put this thing on for them so you don't have to take it home and drill holes in yourself. Thank you. What segment of the market? How many? So there's many different kinds of these boats. Mm -hmm. And... Is it half? Like, how many people have are they, the, these boats just around here? Or is right. it, you know, you go out west, it's a totally different boat? Mm -hmm. Just educate me a little bit there. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I, I, will, I will do my very, very best, but a lot of the very detailed market information is behind very expensive paywalls, $2,000, $3,000 reports. So these type of boats are very popular here in the northeast and really in the south. And so, again, this is rivers, lakes, things like that. Um, and so, basically, like you're saying, once you get to the Rockies, we really start hitting white water. These are rapids that I'm not, I'm not looking to get into. Um, one of the most exciting things for me is I can't wait to see what my European market is like. Because when I was doing customer interviews on Reddit, a lot of my customers were coming from Canada and Europe, and they, they have such a different culture towards kayaking. So, I mean, who, who knows, really, of that sector? But right now, obviously, I'm, I'm focused on the United States. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up on <clears throat> Scott's question. Of course. So, do you know how many boats are out there? So the number of boats, I don't know. So last year, there was $500 million worth of kayaks sold. I, I couldn't get deeper into those numbers without, again, the paywall. And I also know that there was $175 million of kayak accessories sold, and that number is expected to balloon to over $250 million by 2028. Thank you, everybody. You want to wheel that whole table out? No. Can you can you take the whole table, Kevin? All right, all right. Um, so next up, we have CTF Guide. Um, so we're really happy to see them join us this tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pranav Ramesh. I'm the CEO and founder of CTF Guide. To my left, we have Raymond Yen our CTO and co-founder. We are CTF Guide. We are the data-driven simulation platform built for hiring cybersecurity talent. You probably recognize some of those companies up there. And what if I told you they all share one common thing? All these companies have been hit by a major cyber attack within the past five to six years. It's estimated that they've lost over $100 billion. Every single one of these cybersecurity attacks can be attributed to one issue, which is that there is a major cybersecurity talent shortage in our industry right now. Globally, we're seeing about 3.4 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs, and even in the United States alone, we're approaching 1 million unfilled jobs. And this gap is only growing year by year, and the implications are huge for our national security and for all of our cybersecurity companies. So it all kind of boils down to three major problems, right? So the first one is, Learning cybersecurity requires a lot of special tooling. Second, 
it's really difficult for individuals to learn cybersecurity on their own. And third, it's really hard for employers to identify and retain talent. What we're building is a state-of-the-art cybersecurity simulation engine. And this engine not only makes tools accessible for students and educators, it also takes in data metrics that will allow educators and students to practice cybersecurity simulations and then see their strengths and weaknesses by using our tools. This, this engine is the basis for our general user-facing platform and our enterprise user-facing platform, and we'll describe those two parts next. So to address the problem of it being hard for individuals to learn cybersecurity on our own, we built this powerful thing called CTF Guide Learn. It's the data-driven learning platform built for beginners and professionals. We have over 200 community uploaded problems that allow users to test and master their cybersecurity skills. This is an example of the Learn UI. Here you can see it's a simple layout, three major lessons. Users can choose what lesson they want and uh, essentially pick a task to master. This is an example of a dynamic lesson. To the left, you can see there's a ton of content here. It's really nice and pretty. And to the right, we have a, that interactive terminal. And we calculate, hey, are, are they doing things efficiently? Um, and did they do it right, first of all? And for the enterprise-facing side of our platform, one of the biggest issues right now is it's very hard for companies to identify the right cybersecurity talent and then retain them. So we can use our engine that we described before to allow recruiters to give realistic scenarios to interviewees. And then we use our data-driven side to find the strengths and weaknesses and the skills of those interviewees and show them to recruiters. Another thing that we're doing is they can also evaluate their current employees and see if they would be a good fit on the team. So here's a quick look at what the UI might look like for a recruiter. As you can see here, Pranav Ramesh is the, the fake interviewee candidate right here. And the recruiter would be able to see his exact skills on different areas of cybersecurity. Here's also a quick look at the pricing model for our enterprise platform. So for individual simulations, we typically charge $25 per interview. But for bigger enterprises and companies, we work out a special um, deal with them where we charge a base cost of anywhere from one to $5,000 per month. And then for every single person hired through our platform, we get a bonus of 15% of that hiree's uh, yearly salary. And this is the industry standard. And we are, I'm proud to say that we've already established an enterprise deal. Um, so starting in December, we've secured a 12.4K seven month pilot with a major cybersecurity company called Gigamon. They're a billion dollar company. We're already being used by over 50 schools and we have over 1.5 thousand users. We've also run over 10.2K active simulations. And taking a quick look at the future, for the general side, we're looking at expanding to more school and also letting more competitive cybersecurity students use our platform. And then for the enterprise side, our main focus right now is to build a very solid product for Gigamon to use, which would open a lot of doors for us for other enterprise customers. And a quick look at some of the competition. Um, those that are familiar with the ethical hacking space know that there are two main platforms right now, which is Try Hack Me and Hack the Box. They each have about 1.7 million users, give or take. Um, the main difference between them and us is that Try Hack Me is similar to Khan Academy, which is a like, general learning platform, and Hack the Box is approaching it from a gamification standpoint. What we're doing is approaching it from a data-driven standpoint and getting the exact metrics that people will need. And the, another, dis, uh, another difference is that both of these companies are based in the UK and they cannot help the United States fill the talent gap. Now, we've in, invested in a lot of cybersecurity technologies already, now it's time to invest in the people behind those technologies. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, th I think I get it, but just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Are you guys, so you are a platform for people to learn cybersecurity, and in addition, you're also the LinkedIn of cybersecurity in terms of getting people jobs in it. And which is your main focus? So, I mean, I think ultimately the one that's bringing in the most money is the enterprise platform, right? But it's kind of in our core vision to also keep that learning platform alive because ultimately that's what kind of brings all the talent to our website in the first place, right? Because we're attracting the professionals as well because they want to upload content to the website. And then we also have, you know, the complete newbies, you know, people in high school who just want to start learning, learning cybersecurity. 
So who's who's uploading these like tutorials and the teachings and yeah. how are you getting that? So the core content, which was in that kind of that first learn slide, that's being curated by me, Raymond, and a few established cybersecurity people in the industry. There are practice challenges that are community uploaded. Um, general, of course, they are vetted through us and we verify that they're all legitimate and can be solved. Um, but it is kind of a crowdsourced thing, which really opens like we have all sorts of content. We have super beginner friendly content and we have like really like tricky and like requires a lot of technical skill to solve content. My question is, how do you compete with companies who are offering an outsourced product for cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. Why would enterprises want to work with a company like yours and source talent themselves rather than using an agency? Yeah, so um, I think one actually one of the main things is that we're US based, right? So actually even, even, even when you look at our competitors, it's all UK based. There's actually not really a big uh, cybersecurity like recruitment slash ed education company in the United States, right? And especially when you think of like security, right? It's usually a matter of like, it needs to be within the US. There's a lot of considerations that have to be, have to be made. And because we're a US based company, I feel like uh, people like to choose us. And also we really focus on the data, right? So we're able to provide insights that you can't just outsource that. You need like a lot of special algorithms that we've, we're working really hard on like making sure it like gives you the right candidate. Great job, CTF guide. All right, we're going to turn it over to Pitch Stacks next. Um, so Pitch Stacks are going to get ready. They're going to get queued up. So again, uh, Pranav and his company, are, they're freshmen. Uh, they're fre well, Pranav's a freshman. And the next team is um, both out of the Smeal College of Business. So here we go. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew. And I'm Dylan. And we're the co-founders of Pitch Stacks. So student investors across the country in student managed investment funds spend hours upon hours building presentations like this, pitching different stock ideas. So imagine they're saying, this is why you should buy Apple stock. People will spend hours creating this research. And so when they put together this PowerPoint presentation, they present it in front of their fund and 30 minutes later, it's never seen again. And so they're making this research, presenting it, while they're seeking full-time positions as well. Um, and so to talk about the recruiting process overall, while they're doing this research, while kids are in college, they're spending hours doing a bunch of stuff. So they're doing their student orgs to make sure that they're qualified candidates for recruiting purposes. But then for that qualification, they're spending hours on these invest, uh, pieces of investment research. Then from there, they have to network with people. So they're getting on five calls a week, half an hour each, reaching out to tons and tons of people to just get in the door for an internship um, and full time subsequently. So they're spending hours upon hours and people in this position are spending 80 plus hours a week between their organizations, between recruiting. And so that results in burnout. And so our solution is our online platform that we've built, Pitch Stacks. Um, comparative to some of the others in the market where you're contacting sales, spending a lot of money to actually get an account to view this investment research. Uh, with our platform, students are able to go to the website, which is live now, create an account, view other student research, and publish their own in about 30 seconds. And so this easy to use online platform is how we're better connecting these students. And so as to date, we've partnered with investment funds from these 12 uh, universities. Yeah, and so to talk about this, we've gotten on the phone, just talked with the, fa uh, the leaders of all these different organizations, talked with them about onboarding them onto the platform, bringing their students uh, to the table to not only just benefit their own futures, but benefit their orgs, help everyone with the recruiting process overall. Um, and so just talking about our customers overall, our business model is sort of has three different components. So we have our online community, which students are online together building this platform where they're sharing their investment research with each other. Then there's the recruiting side where recruiters, investment firms will be on the platform where they can look at this research and sort of match a resume with a work product to sort of analyze who are the top candidates based on their quality of work, which is a main struggle we've heard from some recruiters at these firms. Um, and lastly, given that there's gonna be a, a large volume of this research on the platform, uh, we're going to offer a retail subscription where people can, uh, I guess, 
uh, overall learn more about uh, different companies to invest in and use this as uh, tips for their own investment research. Um, and so as far as monetization, um, our plan is to keep this completely free for students. Uh, that way students can get, just continue to build this community, uh, post their research, get to know each other, um, improve their futures overall. Um, and where the uh, monetization efforts would occur are through the investment firms, through that recruiting process. Investment firms would pay a monthly subscription to have access to these candidates um, and to their data on the platform. Additionally, that retail subscription I mentioned, which we would also be unveiling, uh, would offer a subscription uh, service each month where people can pay for different investment ideas. Yeah, so to touch about sort of the progress where we're at, uh, as Dylan mentioned, the two monetization uh, aspects through that retail subscription and then onboarding those firms for the recruiting process. Currently, we have this online community or online platform that's being uh, built. We have users joining each day, new pieces of research being uploaded. And so in the future, rolling out that subscription model as, long as, as well as onboarding the firms as well. And so just sort of to go over the basic use of funds, how we'll use the funds awarded tonight, a uh, large aspect of this is actually focused on, you know, our product and development. Uh, most of the costs that have been, you know, that we've occurred have been in the back end hosting, actually building this product out. And so we'll also be using for marketing our team uh, to expand the new schools, add those firms um, as well. Um, so overall, Pitch Tax is the first online community for these student investors to not only benefit each other, but to benefit themselves for their recruiting and for their futures. Thank you, everyone. Happy to take questions. Um, so are you going to build in any kind of ratings or performance analytics on the recommendations that students put out there? Yeah, and that's a great question. So for our retail subscription, those you know top so many uh, stock picks or research that's going to be sent directly to those people subscribing is actually voted upon uh, students on the platform. So on our platform, we have uh, a ranking system. So if you're a user, you can upvote, downvote uh, those uh, posts. And we'll be factoring additional KPIs in there as well. So we'll be able to see how many people viewed posts, liked them, I think time spent on posts as well. Um, and we're going to be waiting all of that to determine what the most viewed and the best posts are overall in order to sort of rank them and then use those analytics for those recruiting purposes. The group members you mentioned are mainly from universities. Uh, do you have any real like seasoned people that have done have experience in the market that are going to contribute into this group as well? Yeah, so overall the focus of the platform is for students and just uh, to mention the overall landscape of the people on the platform, all these are student investment funds specifically. So it's not open to all students altogether, but it's uh, specifically focused to student investment funds that all together, I think on this page alone collectively, those funds manage about $70 million um, in actual equity investments. So that while they aren't uh, professional investors, they are doing all the right research. They're on track to go into those career paths anyways. Um, so although it's not professional research, it's the next best thing to that. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. We're down to our last two for the accelerator contest, and we'll get in closer to the winners. So next up, we have Diana with Alum Lodge, and she's one of our community members. We're really excited to have her join our program this year. So Diana, you ready? Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hanging in with us tonight. Ever think about renting your home on Airbnb? Well, I'm Diana Nelson with Alum Lodge. We list your home, cater to your guests, and clean up afterwards. We manage your Airbnb. The market in State College quintuples its population during home football games. We have 41,000 normal in our population. It balloons to 230,000 during a home football game. Over 100,000 people fit in Beaver Stadium. The influx of population due to seven home games, three graduations, parents weekends, art festivals, and wrestling weekends creates a huge shorting in housing. Currently, there's only a little over 3,000 owner-occupied households in State College. 
And the median gross for two nights on hosting on Airbnb is 2,500. So why aren't more people Airbnb in State College? Well, we found out that there are some roadblocks to our homeowners who don't want to Airbnb their home. And they said, it's too much work. Who wants to do all that work and have people in your house? The fear of city codes. They definitely don't want their neighbors complaining. They worry about their assets and their home. And on top of it, there's pressure for those five-star reviews. Well, Alum Lodge is here to help. We are problem solvers. Alum Lodge cares for your home and guests like their own. They make you feel relaxed. So what exactly will we do? We stage it, photograph it, and list it for you. We have a close relationship with code enforcement to make sure you're legit and your neighbors aren't giving you a headache. We take care of all the guest requests and clean up afterwards. And on top of that, we'll deliver groceries to your guests, and we even bring in our own hospitality linens. So the average three-bedroom home in State College generates 17,500 to 35,000 during one football season. So our streams of revenue at Alum Lodge will be 25% of that total Airbnb gross that our homeowners make. There is currently no competition in State College, Pennsylvania, for property management and Airbnb. The local uh, competitor would be Blue Knob Ski Range, that's 64 miles from here, and they charge upwards of 40% for their gross rentals. We do something more than that. We have customer concierge. All the guest requests will be taken care of by Alum Lodge, and the guests will pay that service. And hospitality linens, these are options for our homeowners to bring in hospitality mat mattress protectors, linens, and pillows for all beds. That's a great concern for many house owners. So the timeline and fund allocation for Alum Lodge, in Q1, we're gonna finish up marketing to homeowners for graduation and arts festival for Airbnb bookings. In Q2, we're gonna invest in data analytics for dynamic pricing, linking events to the Airbnb rental prices so we can do projections for our customers and make sure they're renting their homes on the best weekends to make them the most money. And we're gonna have a huge summer block party to acquire homeowners for the football season. And then in Q3, we're gonna market to 700,000 Penn State alumni, one of the most influential networks in the country. Marketing to homeowners for 2024 calendar as well. I wanna thank you. And my name is Diana Nelson with Alum Lodge. And just remember, we list your home, we cater it, and we clean up afterwards. Thank you. All right, Diana Nelson with Alum Lodge. Judges, you have two minutes for questions. Go, we're going to the real estate property manager first. <laughs> so I've, I have experience with, with actually managing this as well. And uh, one of the the hardest things is the cleaning. How, how many people do you have that so, are in your network ne that work for you? So right now we're just starting up. We got our first client this Sunday, so our charter client. I will be doing everything in the beginning as we scale. Right. Um, what we found is that the laundry, the amount of laundry that you have to have, and the the things that you run into that are unexpected are, you know, sometimes it's it's great. You have a great weekend. You have a great guest, but when you have the bad guests, and if you if you get a lot of properties, you're going to need employees, and it's it's challenging here to to fulfill the needs of, the, of each homeowner. Um, how how do you plan on scaling? Scott, can you mic yourself like here? Sorry about that. Um, we're going to scale by using alumni and the students. I'm going to partner with some of the students here and get them involved. Uh, I will have an intern and some other help. So we're not going to scale too much. This is a service industry. So um, I work a full-time job in linens. I actually produce linens for a huge company. So I have a little bit of an advantage there. Um, so we'll just scale very gradually. Is, is each homeowner going to be purchasing all of that, or are you going to be purchasing no, it, including no. it? I bring that in. Bring that in. Yeah, okay. I bring that in. So you are 
in between the person who wants to rent the Airbnb and the person who owns the home. Correct. What happens? How are you vetting the homeowners? What happens if these people put cameras in and they're spying on their guests? Who's liable? Well, Airbnb has uh, insurance and they have safeties in place. But as far as the added security, I'm going to be on site. A lot of the Airbnb people, they don't want to be home when they're Airbnb. They need a property manager. So my idea with sticking with the guests and having concierge services, being there for them, I'll be checking in and trying to vet them. I think eventually as we go on, I would like to move them off of Airbnb, but that is a process. So right now it'll be a tack on service and eventually we'll scale to our own. So are you logged into the Airbnb of the homeowner and you are responding on their behalf? I would be doing that, yes, correct. We'll set up an account for them that I'll manage. All right, we're out of time. Thank you so much, judges. We're gonna move on to our last pitch of the Accelerator program. Thank you to Diana. Great job, Diana. All right, so next up we have Zoils and Pigments. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Appledon. I'm a PhD student and biology science researcher. Also, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm an artist as well, and uh, I'm a co-founder of Soils and Pigments. And Zoli will continue. My name is Zoeli Rivera. I am also a PhD candidate in soil science, and we are the co-founders of Soils and Pigments, a family-owned business that has as a mission to inspire a lifelong love and relationship with soils and pigments through our paint. So we found there's a lack of trust in what are the contents, ingredients, and sources of pigments used in, in paints and art supplies. So we figured, for example, in the market, in the food market, uh, such as uh, people are more conscious about what are the ingredients in food, uh, where, uh, where does the food come from, et cetera. So we see this also in the art supply. Um, for example, um, so related to this, we found that there's a lack of access to environmentally friendly, non-toxic and non-synthetic pigments used to make art supplies. So for example, today, uh, most of our clothes are dyed with synthetic pigments and many have been found to be harmful to the environment and some to human health. Uh, Malachi green, for example, it has been found to be a car carcinogenic. So what we do in soils and pigments, we merge ancestral techniques with modern science to create handmade soil-based art supplies. As you can see in the first picture, we offer a range of mineral air pigments that goes from brown, gray, sienna, but even more vibrant hues as purple and pink. And we use the raw pigments to create chalks and crayons and also watercolors that we are passing. So uh, something unique about our brand is that we source the uh, pigments directly from the diverse soils of Puerto Rico. And also that we share information about the identity, characteristics, and the origins of each pigment. So uh, basically the process is to collect soil samples. That's probably climbing a, a mountain to get some soil samples. And then we select the colors that we are looking for. We uh, process it essentially to obtain the finest particle sizes, which essentially are the pigments. And then we use those to create different products. In addition, our products add value to our work when artists share that they are using our products because uh, there are more people willing to buy the artwork when they know the location of the pigment that we gather. And even more if the artist has a relationship with the location where we gather the pigments. In the first picture, you can see a jumpsuit that was dyed with our pigments from a fashion designer in New York State University. The second one is a watercolor design that was made with a professional artist in Puerto Rico. And the third one is an artist as she used leather to create keychains and also earrings and she used her watercolors to paint the leather. So uh, based on our customer discovery research, we found that um, basically it's people that, that want to know 
what are the contents, what are the ingredients and origins of the pigments and are looking for uh, a natural and environmentally friendly product. So most of them are between 25 and 35 years old. They have a high level of education. Uh, many of them do uh, art as a hobby or a means of relaxation, but many have been uh, professional artists as well. And um, so customer profile is something that continuously evolves, right? So uh, a recent study found that uh, buyers are more uh, uh, eco-friendly and, and more conscious about the environmental impact of their shopping decisions. And this is uh, good news for us because we uh, uh, strive to provide environmentally friendly products. So our marketing is through direct channel. We sell through social media and also the website. Uh, according to our last sales, we have a projection to make 500 sales per year for this year, having a net income on 32K. So we, our marketing goals go beyond selling to individual customers and retail store. We want to expand to educational organizations such as public school and alternative school because that will enable us to have contract and not only depend on the flux of sales. And this is consonant with a recent article that we found early in March that say that the watercolor industry is expecting a growth in the following years where the main customers will be students and also preschool. So we don't have more time, so this is what we will do with the money uh, that we are seeking. And we will launch a Happy Valley collection with pigments from here, Center County. Also, we aim to build an equipment uh, that will allow us to gather uh, pigments in different locations. And also, we want to move to a plastic-free business doing uh, the pallets from wood and also clay. And finally, we want to print the coloring book that we already developed and yeah, it's ready to print. Thank you. I just wanna know who your competitors are um, and how you compare and why people would choose you over them. So we have a graph that we didn't show here uh, because the time, but we have uh, commercial brands are our main competitors, but also there are some people that may also hand me uh, soil pens as we, but the uh, our advantage is that we always share the location where we gather the pigments, so we build this trust relationship with, with the customers. Uh, and commercial brands, they don't share where they took the pigments, and most of them are synthetics. Hi, uh, I'm glad you added the chart on the potential customers, the market, because I think you had your customer profile defined way too narrowly. You know, I, I see this very popular for preschools, school, other schools. Yes, um, that customer profile was developed when we were working as a DBA, but now that we are an LLC, so we are targeting to have this broader uh, customer, yeah. yeah. How many people does it take to have a successful market? How many people working on getting the materials? So currently our team is far ourselves and also our mothers in Puerto Rico because our pigments come from Puerto Rico so we cannot uh, bring soil to United States according the USDA regulation. So they, have, they know how to process the pigments uh, so they send us the pigments. So, so far we are just Three-ish, yeah. <laughs> Long-winded as always, um, but how, if you, you know how to do it in Puerto Rico, but the to, to source this elsewhere, there has to be a lot of research that goes into that and time and energy, and how would you go about doing that in? Um, so one of the- Question. Uh, one of our strength is that I am a soil scientist. So before going to the field, like, looking around what colors I can see, we do research using uh, scientist tools uh, so we can map and we know uh, the colors that are around and also not, because you can see a soil that is brown but in the depth layer is another color. So we, we recognize that before going to the field. So that maximize the efficiency of our field work. Yeah. 
All right, judges, we're going to take you into the hallway. Actually, I think we opened the conference room for you so you get a little more comfy spot. And I'm going to turn it over to James, and he's going he's gonna to give us some time. Yay. Let's give them all a round of applause again. Yes. Wonderful. I know we're, we're over time a little bit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some fun stuff in here as we wait to find the winners. Uh, that was so great. That was so great. So thank you all for uh, being here. So I wanted to, uh, are there, is anyone here, uh, because that last presentation reminded me of a joke that I do, so I'm going to uh, do it. Is anyone here by a round of applause, where are my uh, dog people at? And you have pet dogs by a round of applause. We have some dog people. That's good. Uh, what type of dog do you have? Oh, Okay. Okay. Oh, how big is that dog? 25. Oh. Small basset hound. I have two small dogs uh, to about 25 to 35 pounds. Dakota's a puggle. Does anyone know what a puggle is? It's a pug and beagle mix, and they're super, super playful. Uh, she's eight years old. She still runs around. Uh, she'll jump on you. Uh, she'll, she'll bite when she's playing, but she doesn't draw blood because she can't hold colored pencils. Um, thank you. Hi, there we go. There we got it. Yeah, it's a blood pun. It's definitely a blood pun for sure. Uh, I have lots of blood puns for sure. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna test a couple out. It'll be some A/B testing here, um, so we'll do that. <laughs> so dumb. I know. You don't like that one, Lee. You don't. Your boo. Well, I'll just do. I wrote <laughs> I wrote a comedy piece over the pandemic that the title was just called "Just Blood Puns." Um, yeah, it was read a ton of times. It really was for it. <laughs> no, so. Yeah, no, they were they were pretty pretty dumb. Uh, but the reason why I started writing blood puns for uh, some comedy stuff because I used to uh, I used to work as a copy editor for the Red Cross. Uh, I would go through and do a bunch of their copy editing, uh, but I didn't have enough typos for them. So they, uh, <laughs> yeah. I need to be more positive. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I had too many typos. Is that better? Which I thought was is there there would be going well. Uh, so Nathan, right, Nate, Nathan? Nathan asked if we could learn, uh, if I could teach people to do a little bit of improv. Uh, and so what I wanted to spend a little bit of time here doing is for those of you who want to participate with the person near you, you can pair up with somebody and we're going to do a very, very basic improv exercise. You're going to build a story together. So you are going to build a story together with the person next to or across from you. Nobody else is going to hear this story unless you, unless you end up sharing it out to us. So you don't have to worry about that. I won't force anybody to share it. But what we're going to work on is the main idea of improv. So who in here knows what the main idea that makes improv work? So anyway, it's a two-letter saying that is really big in improv. Ben, do you want to say it? Yes, sir. It is the idea of yes and. Ben, what does yes and mean? Exactly. So we, when we talk about yes and, we talk about accepting the uh, event has just happened and make that is now in the reality. And how do we build upon it productively? Now, I'm going to take a minute to let you know what we don't mean is that yes means you have to say yes and agree with anything that is stated. Because that is not uh, the type of culture that we'd want to create at the Blue Brick Theater or improv in general. The idea of yes and is that something happens and we have to accept that that is now the reality. And how do we respond to that thing productively? And what we tell our students is sometimes a productive response to a situation is actually to get out of the situation and to say no. But we want to accept what's happening as that is true, and how do we build productively onto it, right? Yes and attitude of like working together works very, very well if both people are invested in the idea of building and in the idea of saying yes and. It is impossible to yes and somebody who wants to only know but you. So if I'm talking with someone and I'm saying, let's go to the park, and they say, no, let's go to the beach, and I say, yes, and we can build a sandcastle and they say no oh we need to go uh fishing 
that conversation is never going to happen. And that may be on an improv stage, but it also might be in your boardrooms for your startups. It might be uh, talking with somebody about politics. You can have a very productive conversation with people who are disagreeing if you're both agreeing to say, okay, what you say is true and valid, and how can we respond productively to it? So I'm going to do a little bit of a game with anybody who wants to play this game, and you just have to be at your seats when you're doing it. So partner up with somebody near you if you want to participate, and you're going to play, play a game which is aptly described as It's Tuesday. And guess what? Today is Tuesday. So there's a one in seven chance that when I run a workshop or do something improv, we actually get to play It's Tuesday on Tuesday, and that is today. So what you're going to do is you're going to pair up with someone next to you if you want to play, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, one person, you'll decide, whoever's player A, is going to start telling a story by saying the words, it's Tuesday. The next person is going to respond by saying yes, and I'm going to make it easy for the second person. I want you to say a name that's not one of the names of the two people that are, in this, that are telling the story, and that person does something. So for example, it's Tuesday, yes, and Sarah was playing basketball. Yes, Sarah loved basketball. Yes, Sarah has loved basketball since she was two. Yes, because her dad won a championship when she was two. Yes, and he grabbed her and threw her in the air when he won. And you're just gonna tell a story over one line at a time for the two people that are telling the story. Does that make sense? All right, so pair up with someone near you and start, figure out who's gonna be player A and player B. I'm gonna let this go for 35 to 45 seconds, and then we're gonna share some of these stories. We're gonna do it on the count of three, and a one, and a two, and a one, two, three, go. And pause. All right, give your partner a fist bump. Who would like to share out a summary of their story? Who would like to share out a summary of their story? Back here, okay. Also remember this is recorded, so make sure, share some of your story. Okay, so I said it was Tuesday and then he said he was gonna win this thing and then he said that he's not gonna win and then he said that he's gonna win and then she said that she's gonna win and then I said we're gonna go to rock climbing after. That doesn't seem like a very yes and story for me. Uh, uh, so, so we started with it's Tuesday and then someone said they were gonna win and what, should, what could you have done there? Yes, they're gonna win for sure. <laughs> oh, so now he's lying. I see what that, that's, uh, someone's a liar. That's all right, it's all right. Uh, other people, who else would like to share out where their story went? Does anybody wanna share their story? Right here. So it started off with it's Tuesday. And then she told me about Sammy who dropped off this package, this huge package. It was full of instruments and she had all these instruments and we opened it up and then remembered that we sucked at instruments. We played it back in high school. And then we thought to ourselves, okay, I'm playing this cello. And I remember back in high school, she's making fun of us. So that's how our Tuesday went. Did anybody else have a story about playing instruments? Nobody else did because that's what the power of yes and in can just spread to anything. Uh, does anyone else have, uh oh. I love when people make eye contact with me and then they look away very quickly. They're uh, like, does anybody else want, no, I don't want to share. So does anybody else want to share where their story went? Okay, what did some pairs find easy and or hard about that process? Con oh, continuing, okay, explain that. What do you mean by that? You didn't know where to go next. Do I, oh, we were just talking about this over here with the instruments. Does anyone in here play an instrument by a show of hands? Anyone here play an instrument? Does, okay, does anybody play jazz piano? Can I get any specific? You do, you play jazz piano. Awesome, if I had a piano up here, right, would you play jazz piano with me? And if I pressed any button, that's a key, actually, you could tell how much I know about music. If I press any key, could you improvise off of that key? You can't, why can you improvise off of that key? Right, because the first key when you're playing anything in music can't be wrong. It can't. The second key can make the first key sound wrong, the first thing. But you can, what is that? It's jazz, so anything happens. But we might say, ooh, that doesn't sound good. But we'll still say it sounds good if you play the right second key. And in improv, it doesn't matter. Anything you say can be true because the next person, as long as they're responding productively, can bring it up. So there. So Nathan. 
I taught you a little bit of improv. I learned so much. You learned so much on how to yes and. But we have our uh, judges back, so it looks like we have prizes to give out. Um, and if the person who wins the iPad doesn't want it, I'll take it. Um, I'll just let you know that I'll take it if you don't want it. Uh, would love to take it. All right, Elizabeth, am I giving this back to you? All right, and let's give our judges one more round of applause uh, for doing all this work. So before we begin, we have, um, we wanna recognize a couple of advisors and turn that over to Ben to make those recommendations. Oh, sweet. Uh, so one of my jobs here is to help run the advisor network, which is engaging with some amazing and wonderful people who are just volunteering their time. I don't know why. Maybe they've made some terrible decisions. Maybe this is part of their mandatory public service. Who knows? But they keep coming back for more. And so I want to recognize two advisors that have done above and beyond. These are people that have come up here a number of times. They've spent hours and hours and hours working with our team specifically here. Um, and I'll say uh, it's been incredible. And I will say again, and I say to a lot of my emails to advisors, we cannot do this without you. We're a team of three. We have relative, our, our minds are finite. And the reason we have this network is because we can pull upon others. So uh, the first person I would like to recognize today, um, the former director of the Happy Valley Launchbox, Liz Kissenweather. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for this guy. No, get on up here, Liz. Good Lord. Yes. So what we've done is we've created a North Star Award. This is a new award that we started to give to advisors because we wanted some way to recognize how awesome they are. And we thought you needed more stuff in your life. So we gave you some stuff. So this is the North Star Award. It's, it's, it's presented. Go ahead. You can. You okay. <clears throat> the North Star Award is presented to an individual who has gone above and beyond in mentoring our teams at the Happy Valley Launch Box. This award is meant to recognize an entrepreneur in residence or advisor who has served as a guiding light, providing direction, insight, and mentorship. The North Star Award is bestowed upon only the raddest of individuals, those who have exceptional leadership, expertise, and dedication to our community, and have helped our teams to navigate the challenges of entrepreneurship and finding success. You are the North Star, you are guiding our people. So here you go, Liz, thank you again for incredible service. Another round of applause for Liz. She's one of our favorites. I don't know how many hours. I think we've lost track. We don't have any more ticks on the wall because we've run out of wall. Yeah, we're, yeah, so a candle from one of our recent teams. It smells awesome. No, thank you. Again, thank you, Liz, for being incredible. And the next North Star Award that we have for this evening goes to Michael Wojcik over there. That handsome devil over there. Get on up here, you sneaky devil. And I, I, I could read it again. Uh, do, would you like me to? I think. Again, this goes to the raddest of individuals with exceptional leadership, expertise, and dedication to our community. You are helping to lead and guide our people. I think you are our first entrepreneur in residence here. So congratulations for being the first, being our guinea pig and surviving. He has, I think, most of his fingers and toes. So he has survived so far at the Happy Valley Launchbox. Oh, and a photo time. Favorite. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. You are incredible. Again. Don't swim, don't do your next uh, Iron Man with that. It'll be hard to carry. All righty, and we're going to hand this over to Elizabeth. She's got what you're really here for, right? Well, at least the teams, everyone else. Um, these are the awards. Ready? All right, we're starting with the MVP program, the build program, and we're really excited to be able to offer these awards to the top. Uh, teams in the MVP program. We're going to start with third place. Third place, so is a $150 gift card to Finding Community. Come on up, Elise. Um, in, in second place, we have Danger Fit. So again, MVP program, Danger Fit has worked through a lot of stuff and we're really proud to award this $250 gift card to Danger Fit to Amazon. Oh, <laughs> hey, don't forget us. <laughs> All 
All right, I know the judges really struggled with this one, but the first place award goes to Beyond Class. <laughs> Give her, give her mad props for that reaction. Wait, wait, do I get the award? It's right there, All right, well, we didn't want anybody to leave empty handed, so we have a couple more gift cards to give to the rest of the teams. Come on up, Becky. Come on up um, from POS, P PCOS. Come on up, um, Sage Art. And group it. Let's go. Come on up. Do a big group photo. Get out of here. Can you let everyone come on? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's come all together. together. There's oh, Beth Grubet. That's yours. That's Sage Art. Yeah. Over here. Over here. Turn it around the other way. Yeah. All right, great job, guys. So those gift cards are to Amazon, and we're going to announce in just a moment the accelerator programs. Um, but thank you to our sponsors tonight and all the people who have attended, our judges. Thank you so much for coming and your deliberation on these. Um, I know it was a tough, tough call. So um, we will start with second place. All right, so in second place tonight, we have the Zoils and Pigments. The judges have awarded them $2,000. Come on up, Zoils and Pigments. We've been working with them so much this semester. Great work, you guys. An amazing job pitching. <laughs> All right. All right, and in first place, drum roll. Everybody on the tables, here we go. All right, in first place, we have CTF Guide with $3,000. These guys came into our program like uh, super young and they've been working hard. <laughs> Again, no one's leaving empty handed. So the rest of our teams will bring up. We have a $100 gift card for the rest of our team. We have Pitch Stacks, $100. We have Alum Lodge, $100 gift card. And Wave Breaker, $100 gift card. Everybody's worked so hard. I know the judges struggle with these This is. This has been a great competition. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and hanging out. And um, we have a lot of leftover food, so please hang out and eat some food. So thank you. Have a good night.